guys. So we are starting a brand new series, and this is a series called Boss. Series called Boss. They're gonna bring something on stage, so ignore them or praise them. It's Keaton and Derek. Round of applause. Okay, we could move it right this way. Okay, this way. Okay, there we go. That's perfect. All right. So uh, I want to start off with a question. Have you ever? Ever been bossed around? Yes. Have you okay? Give us some examples of times you have been bossed around that frustrates you. Uh, Isaac. <laughs> okay, he gets bossed around by his girlfriend Cassie. Give it up for Cassie because Isaac probably deserves it. All right, Kristen. Okay, by her sister Lauren, who is the prom queen. You've been bossed around before and by him. Yes. My mom. Your mom? Okay. And? Every time Andrew opens the mouth. Every time Andrew, okay, that is true. Okay. Uh, I am joking, Andrew. All right. So some of you, it, adult, an adult in your life, some of you, it was a, a bossy sibling or a girlfriend. Uh, we all have people that boss us around, and, and we know that we have those people in our life, and, and sometimes it's, it's because of a control issue. Sometimes that's a big part of it. Sometimes it's because they're trying to be a parent or, or teach you. Sometimes they just are stronger than you and you are weak. But the thing is this, I'm joking. We have those people in our life. Uh, next question is this, how does it feel to be bossed around? How does it feel? Okay, Isaac, again. It feels terrible. Okay. Who else? To feel bossed around. How do you feel about it, Paul? Priscilla. Frustrating. frustrating. It's very frustrating. Yeah, shaggy. You feel weak. Yeah, you feel weak at times. Makes me upset. Makes you upset. Yes. And so all of us, we have these emotions that happen when, when someone's trying to boss us around. And, and I don't know about you guys, but in my life, when I felt that way, I just want to scream, you're not the boss of me. All right, so this morning, I want to do something a little different. At the count of three, we are going to yell as loud as we can, you are not the boss of me. Can we do that as a group? I know we got some tired people from prom. We got some people missing from prom. We have uh, a great morning, but, but we need to get some energy out. So at the count of three, we're going to yell, you're not the boss of me. Ready? One, two, three. Do we feel better? Yes. Take that, Grandma. Okay, here's the thing. <laughs> we needed that. Okay. So I don't know about you, uh, but there are people in my life who like to boss me around. And, and some of them are, are little wee lads, right? I woke up this morning, I am exhausted. We had a middle school overnighter called Axia, and we had however many middle schoolers and adults here, uh, probably over 100, and, and I was exhausted because yesterday I didn't get to go home and sleep. I had to go and pick up my kids, and, and I met my in-laws halfway. They had them for a week, which was awesome. And then we met halfway in between St. Louis and here, and, and it was just over the border in Illinois. And so then I got them, I came home, and then they're on the couch, and it's not within a couple minutes like Dad drank. And I'm like, you go get your own drink, Milo. And so he went, and he had this giant jug of milk, and he's carrying it. He's like, milk. And I'm like, okay. And then this morning, they woke up early, and, and they're yelling at me again. I'm like, I got to look over my notes. I got to pray. I want to you know, read the Bible, get ready for this day. And they're like, Dad, milk! Okay? And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Except Milo didn't sound like a 30-year-old man. Okay? But the more, the more along the lines of milk, sweet daddy. Not English. Okay. But the thing is... <laughs> They, they're bossy, 
They're little creatures, and, and, and they're bossy. And, and I don't know if anyone has told you this before, and, and speaking specifically to where some of you are, is you guys are at the stage of life where, where you don't like to be told what to do. You guys are on that line of, hey, I'm becoming an adult. Like, I, I, I get ready, I study, I, I train, I, I work. And you, some of you drive, some of you pay for your car and insurance and fuel, all that. And you're like, hey, I want to have these freedoms. And, and I want to tell you this, that's normal. That's actually a normal thing. And, and to be honest, when preparing for this, I think God actually made it that way. Because when we were born, as we needed our parents to boss us around, we needed them to help us. If we didn't have them, we would have died. We needed them to have complete control of our lives. You know, my kids, I, and I talk about them a lot, my five-year-old daughter and my three-year-old son, I love them and they're so much fun. And they're gaining independence. They're growing in it. But, but I'm just happy that Milo, he's in a toilet, you know? I'm happy now that Hannah can get dressed and I don't have to pick out her clothes. And she's like, Dad, that looks hideous, you know? She's making her comments. Like, I, those are victories, but there's going to be a day where, where she will have to, to work through some heavy conflict. I won't be there for her. So there's this natural progression in, in, innately in us where we will gain independence through time and eventually we'll be set free. So where you are in your life and, and some of the struggles you have with individuals that are trying to boss you around, not just parents, not just teachers, not just coaches, maybe even youth pastors or youth leaders or friends, that's a normal thing. Some of you, you fight with your parents every single day. It is, it is a war in the home, and it's because you are in that phase where you want to be free. I want to be done. I want to be, I want to be my own person, but you're not there yet. You're not there yet. And so we're going to be talking about this for a couple weeks because it's one of those topics you don't hear a lot about. Like, okay, respect your elders and, you know, be nice to your parents if they tell you anything you room. That's not what I want to talk about. Those, those things are important to a degree. But I want to talk one step further into the heart of it, into what the real issue is. And so if, if you see up here, I have a desk. And, and on this desk, uh, I got a really old laptop and, and a chair that's kind of falling apart, my pens. And, and the reason I have this up here is because um, I want you to be thinking of a boss. I have my favorite cup up here, if you see it. Um, it says, Jesus loves you like Kanye loves Kanye. All right? And he loves himself a lot. And so the reason I have this up here is because um, we want to be our own boss. We struggle to want to have this seat. And, and I could prove this to you, and I'm going to be talking about it for a couple weeks, but, but I could prove it today it is because we don't like people telling us what to do. Period. So why would that be any different with God? I mean, think about that for a second. Why would it be any different when God tries to tell us things to do? Because in our mind, no, no, I, I am my own boss. Like, you can't tell me what to do. And, and so that struggle starts to seep into our relationship with God. If you have some authority issues with your parents, most likely you're going to have some authority issues with God when he tells you certain things. And we say these things a lot like, don't let us and our ideology shape the Bible. Let the Bible and its ideology shape us. You know, sometimes I'll have a tough conversation with someone and, and it'll be a hot topic issue. I mean, you, you fill in the blank, guys. I mean, politics. A sexuality, you know, uh, pro-life, pro-choice. You, you think about the hardest conversations that anyone can have in our culture today. And, and there comes a time when I'm just like, hey, I live and I die on the word of God. And so th this is what I believe 
best is portrayed in God's Word. That's why it's so important to know God's Word. Because when we know God's Word, we know what, what He wants us to know and live by. And one thing He makes very clear is that, man, we, we struggle to be our own boss. We struggle to want to be the Lord of our own life. And, and I think about with my life and my teenage years, I got, I got so many examples. I think, about, I think about my family and I think about my mom and, and growing up. Uh, I had a lot of moments with her that I struggled. You know, my dad, he was, he was a quiet man. He was a respectful man. He was a man of few words. Uh, he, was, he was a person that he was my father. He was my dad. He was there. But, but my mom more connected with me in, in the emotional side and in the punishment side. Now, my dad still did those things, but he wasn't the person doing the day-to-day, itty-bitty, minute, like, you got to get this done. You got, do you guys have a family like that? Like your dad, you'll come and he'll, he'll show up in the big times. Like, hey, you don't treat your mom like that. Or, hey, you will get this done. But the little, the little knick-knack things, that's where my mom came in. And so when I was dealing with her, there was, there was constant battles. And, and one of the things that we battled about was well, she was always embarrassing me. Like all the time. And, and I attribute today... I attribute today why I'm more comfortable speaking and being myself. I attribute it to her. But at the time, when there's a girl you like, and your friends are there, and you're so self-conscious about what people think, it ruined me. It really felt like she was ruining my life at the time. And I laugh today because I'm going to do the same thing to my kids. I cannot wait to ruin their lives. But the thing is this. In the moment, I'll get so angry. Mom, like, why did you you show up to school? You know? Why did you embarrass me in front of my friends? Like, why why did you do those things? And and, and it drove drove me crazy, and we would get into it. And the minute that I thought she was getting better was the minute she one-upped herself. You guys know some one-uppers? We got some one-uppers in this room. People would take a story, and I'll be like, yeah, so, you know, I hit a home run, it was 300 feet, and they're like, <laughs> I hit, yeah, I hit three, and they all, like, hit someone in a plane or whatever, okay? But the thing is this, like, man, I, she always won up. She always found a way to do something else. One of my favorite stories, I don't have this in my notes, and this isn't me, uh, this is actually uh, a time that my dad was kind of embarrassed. So my dad would drive this bus, uh, for this, this facility in town for the people who were handicapped and elderly. And he did it because he's a nice guy. And they were connected with something, it was this kind of like a salvation army. So people, homeless people in the area could go and get clothing and food. And so he was really close with the director of this facility. And my dad was there, he was talking to this director. They were real good friends. But just like, not really like she knew my family, but, but they had a good friendship. And then here drives up a person in an old beat up car. And the person steps out of the car and is wearing like a coat over a coat and a hat and then a hat underneath and then the gloves with the fingers showing. And this lady is going on with this story about how, you know, some of these homeless people, they just take and take and take and they don't appreciate. And then she looked over and she said, like, see, there's one right there coming here before we even open to come and get stuff from, from Salvation Army. My dad looked over, it was, it was my, my mom. <laughs> <laughs> and so the lady was like, oh. And, and so she would wear like coats and hats and like gloves. She looked like a homeless person, okay? And she's like, oh, I'm so sorry. But, but even the way she would kind of disappear, it really embarrassed me. And so I struggled with, with respecting her. I, I struggled with her authority in my life for years. And, and there's so many more stories. I remember uh, the time that we were playing basketball and my mom would walk around the track jiggling her keys. You know, every time I'd score a basket or something would happen, she'd be exercising. She'd bring five pound weights and walk around the track and then she'd jiggle her keys. And I was like, Mom, go away. And, and I think back about that. But when we're the boss, 
we might think that we're all that matters. You know, I wanted you to think about that perspective. When we're the boss, when we're in the seat, we might think that we're the only people in the world. My mom was supporting her son. How many people would love for their moms to be supporting uh, their children or, or themselves? Or the time I had people over my house and my parents made it abundantly clear to, to stay in the home, not sneak out, not do anything. And so I proceeded to sneak out. And when I snuck out, I went to TP someone's house. We got Vaseline, we got baby powder, we got forks, everything. Well, then we were busted by the cops, okay? We found ourselves running through fields and, and we have to realize when we're our own boss, we can cause a lot of damage. You know, they made it crystal clear what their expectation was. Or the time uh, I knew in my whole heart that I needed to be bold with someone. I knew I needed to speak truth into their life because God was, God was directing me. I didn't want to because it was the person, I didn't like them. Think about that person right now you don't like. You just don't get along with, they frustrate you, they hurt you. Now imagine that God wanted you to talk to that person and invest in that person. That's what he was calling me to do. He was calling me to reach out to the person and, and I chose not to. When we're our, our own boss, we can miss out on what God has made that's best for us. Even if, even if we don't feel it. So the idea of being your own boss, it, it might sound great, but it's not, it's not always easy. And it doesn't always make the best for you. We might think that it's best to be in the sea, but when we're in the sea and we don't follow God's, God's law, God's word, we don't give him up, give up to him what is rightfully his, we're gonna struggle. So when it comes to this topic of who is your boss, Here's what I want you guys to take from today. There's a very fine line, specifically for teenagers. There's a very fine line, we're going to get deep, between independence and idolatry. There's a very thin line between, yeah, I just want to be independent and idolatry. I'm going to explain that. Idolatry means this. It's an extreme admiration, love, and reverence for something or someone. You know, we hear in the Old Testament, uh, as some of you heard this about uh, the Israelites, they worship idols. And we're going to be talking about that in a second. In the book of Exodus, they worship idols. And, and it's because they had this extreme admiration for these gods. And sometimes, with us, sometimes we're the God. Sometimes it's not independence, it's, it's we're, our idols are us. Whatever makes us happy. And this was the same thing going on in the Word of God, in the book of Exodus. Uh, we get to read this story, and you've heard about it, some of you have heard about it. It's the story of these Israelites, God's people, and, and they were brought out of Egypt. And they were saved in miraculous ways. And maybe you've heard of God parting the, the Red Sea. And then he led them in the wilderness. And there was this journey that they were going to take to the promised land. A land flowing with milk and honey. A land that would be theirs. It was supposed to be a three week trip. But it took them 40 years. It wasn't because they were getting lost. It was because they kept, they kept going against God and, and following these idols. And, and eventually they, they had this moment where Moses went up this mountain. God said, come to the top of this mountain and I'm going to show you. I'm going to give you these laws. And you're supposed to follow these laws. And when he was gone, they made a golden calf. So in that moment, he came down, he saw what they were doing, he threw the tablets down that we know as the Ten Commandments, 
And then uh, they purified the nation one more time. They destroyed the calf. He went back up the mountain and he got 10 more commandments. And so we're not going to talk about all 10 commandments, but we are going to talk about the first commandment. We're going to talk through this one, and it's going to be through Exodus chapter 20, verse 1 through 3. And this is what it says. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. So when this part of Israel's story is taking place, you have to know that there was a lot of idols at this time. There's, some of them are called Baal. Some of them are called the Ashram. There was a whole bunch of them. And, and they really believed that these gods were real. And, and they believed in the God of Israel, our God, but, but they also believed in these other gods and they were almost like rivals. Like, oh, I wonder if Baal can, can rival our God or I wonder if Ashram will, will battle our God. And then further along, there was other nations that came along. And so there's Greek mythology, you know, Apollos and, and Hermes and all this stuff. And, and so they, they believed in, in the Christian God, but they also believed in these other gods. Ironically, none of those gods still exist. But God does. So what's going on is they say in here, in the first command, you shall have no other gods before me. The word before in this verse, when translated, doesn't have to do with order or rank. No other gods before me. Like, you can have other gods, but, but I am, you know, your main god. What this is saying is there's supposed to be nothing else. Like, I'm it. I am the one and only. So what they're saying is, I am going to be God, period. So why am I talking about this? What does this ancient story about idols have to do with us? We probably have some rival gods. We probably have some things in our life you know, that, that could that could take the place of God. But today, you, you might not be tempted as much. That might not be an issue. You might not have literal gods that you praise and light candles to and sacrifice things to. But you will absolutely be tempted to worship the God of you. I want to show you guys something. <laughs> Beautiful little statue. We're going to show a different thing each week. And, and this week, what I want to show you that, that we worship it is the God of us. The worship of whatever we want. Maybe we don't have a golden calf. But we have a golden Shazam. <laughs> and maybe we need to realize that, that God, he wants to challenge that in our life. He wants to challenge our idols. See, God, he wants to be it. He doesn't want us to have any robbery. And, and there's something in the word of God where, where people, they just... They're just selfish. They just want to be praised. They just want to be elevated. They want to be recognized. And even Jesus' disciples were this way. Even the very ones who followed Jesus, he had these 12 disciples, and, and they followed him around, and he trained them, and he taught them. Listen to this story. This is in Mark 10, 35. And this is what's going on with James and John. We're going to put it up here. It's, it's Mark 10, 35 to 30, 37. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other one sit in your left with your glory. So what they're saying is these disciples, they follow Jesus around 
And, and they said, okay, we realize you're a really important dude, and, and you are the son of God, and maybe you'll have an imperial empire, or maybe you'll have a heavenly empire, but can we ask you a favor? When the time comes, can we be at your right and left? Like, when that time actually comes, can we be the, the cool people? So they wanted to be in that seat. They had the audacity to go to the Son of God and say, hey, um, can you give us something more? Listen to Jesus' response here. He says in verse 38 through 45, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answer. What they didn't know is he was saying, hey, I'm going to die. Do you really want to take the cup I'm taking? You want to die? You want to die for, for God? They said, yes, yes we do. They didn't know what they were asking for. We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I baptize with. But to sit at my right or my left, it's not for me to bring these places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them all together and said, You know what? Those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them? Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be a slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Guys, these disciples, they got upset. Not because they're like, man, that's so selfish. They probably got upset because they were mad they didn't do it first. Have you guys ever had some issues within your friend circles? Disciples did. Did someone have to bring you guys together and say, hey, let's work this out? Jesus did. They had some drama. We got drama at youth group. Got a lot of drama. But the thing is this, we try to work it out. And so with this, Jesus is calling them out and, and he's telling them the way to defeat the God of me. We defeat the God of me when we give up our seat. That's how we defeat the God of me. When we get, give up the seat, because some of us, we're sitting here, we're lounging out, we're, we're saying, hey God, I'm not going to give up this part of my faith. I'm not going to give this area away. Like, you can tell me, okay, I'll show up to church, but I'm not going to stop being that person. I'm not going to start, you know, being that kind of example at school. I'm not going to stop being sexually active. I'm not going to stop, you know, struggling with pornography. I'm not going to stop, you know, being constantly, like, self-deprecating about myself and, and, and challenging others and being rude and gossiping and cheating. Like, you can take certain aspects of, of my life, but, but not this. Because I really like it. I really like the attention. I like how guys make me feel. I like how girls look at me. I like the power. I like the authority. I like showing a little something. something. I, like, I like posting stuff like that. So, so I can get people liking more stuff. You know, we attract what we dress for. I like those things. You know, and really, I, I don't even care. It's a dangerous spot to be in. Well, God says the way you defeat the God of me by giving up the seat. Actually, God, I, I don't want that anymore. I want you to have a seat. So in all those things I just mentioned, I want to take those and, and I don't want to just base it on my culture, the way I live, the, the way my friends act. I want to base it on what you said and what you want from my life. The way you defeat the God of me is by giving up your seat.